Live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering Pentaho World 2017. Brought to you by Hitachi Ventara. Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Pentaho World, brought to you by Hitachi Vantara. My name is Rebecca Knight, I'm your host, along with my co-host, Dave Vellante. We're joined by Michael Weiss, he is the Senior Manager at NASDAQ, and Sheer Seiden, who is Analytics Manager at NASDAQ. Thanks so much for coming, on, for coming back to theCUBE, I should say, yes. you're CUBE veterans now. We are, well at least I am. This is his first yeah. year and his first time at Pentaho World, so. Excited to bring him along. Okay, so you're a newbie, but you're a veteran. Yeah. So. <laughs> Great. So, so tell us a little bit about what has changed since the last time you came on, which is 2015, back, back then. So the, the biggest thing that's happened in the past 18 months is we've launched seven new exchanges, uh, integrated seven new exchanges. We've, uh, we bought the ISE, the uh, International Stock Exchange, which is uh, three options markets. We just completed that integration in August. Uh, we've also bought uh, the Canadian, Shyx, the Canadian Exchange, which also had three equities markets, so we integrated them. And we went live with a dark pool offering for Goldman back in June. So now we operate a, a dark pool for Goldman Sachs and we're looking to kind of expand that offering at this point. So, so you're just getting bigger and, and bigger. And so tell, us, uh, tell our viewers a little bit how Pentaho fits into this. So Pentaho is, is the uh, engine that kind of does all our analytics behind the scenes at post-trade, right? So we do a lot of uh, traditional ETL, we're doing batch processing in the back end, we're doing a little bit more with the uh, Hadoop ecosystem, leveraging things like EMR, uh, Spark, Presto, that type of stuff, with, and Pentaho kind of helps uh, blend that stuff together a little bit. Um, we use it for reporting, we do some of the BA. Uh, we're actually now looking to have pen, tip the data Pentaho generates, plug in a little bit of Tableau. So we're, we're looking to expand it and really leverage that data in other ways at this point. Even doing some things more externally, uh, offering data, doing more data offerings via uh, Pentaho externally. So I got to do a NASDAQ one-on-one from my 13-year-old. <laughs> came up to me the other day and said, Daddy, what's the NASDAQ index and how does it work? <laughs> Give us a 20-second answer. On the NASDAQ could. index? Yeah, what's the NASDAQ index and how does it work? <laughs> Probably the wrong person to answer that one, <laughs> but um, I mean, the NAS an index is generally just a blend of various stocks, right? So the S&P 500 is a blend of the top of different stocks, much like that, the Qs are, are NASDAQ's equivalent of the S&P, right? So we use a different algorithm to determine the uh, companies that are make up that blend, but it, it's an index like just like the S&P. They're weighted by market cap, and right, that yeah. determines the number at the end, and it goes Correct. up and down based on what the stock's in that Right, and that's, and that's how most people know NASDAQ, right? They see the S&P went up by five points, the Dow went down by three, and the NASDAQ went up by a point, right? But right. most people don't realize that NASDAQ also operates 20, 27 worldwide, exchanges worldwide, I think it is now. So, probably a little bit more, maybe closer to 32, but. So you mentioned that you, you, you're doing a dark pool for Goldman. Yes. So that's interesting. We were talking off camera about HFT and kind of the old days and, and dark pools were, were criticized at the time. Now Goldman was one of the ones that was see, shown to be honest and you know, above board, but, but what does that mean, you know, the, the dark pool for, for your business and how does that all sort of tie in? So, I mean, dark pools are isolated markets, right? So they don't necessarily interact with the NASDAQ exchange themselves. It's all done within the pool. You interact with only people trading on that pool. What NASDAQ has done is we took our technology and we, we now host it for Goldman. So our, we have INET's our trading system, so we, we gave them INET. Um, we built all the surrounding solutions, uh, how you manage symbols, how you manage membership, uh, even the data. We, 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 we curate their data into AWS. Uh, we do some Pentaho transformations for them. We do some analytics for them. And that's actually going to start expanding. But yeah, we, we, we provided them an entire solution. So now they don't have to manage their own dark pool. Uh, and now we're going to look to expand that to other, other potential clients. So, so that's NASDAQ as a technology yes. provider. It's very interesting. So I was saying you know, earlier, Hong Kong Stock Exchange is, is basically closing the facility where they house humans. Again, another example of machines replacing being humans. So they're joining, well, NASDAQ kind of, but NYSE, London Stock Exchange, Singapore, now, now Hong Kong, essentially electronic trading. So, brings us to the sort of technology sort of underpinnings of, of NASDAQ. Sure, maybe you could talk a little bit about you know, your role and give paint a picture of the technology infrastructure. Yeah, so um, I focus primarily on the financial side, the corporate, like corporate finance. So we, we leverage Pentaho to do a lot of the data integration, allow us to really answer our business questions. So previously it would take days to put basic reporting together. Now you've got it all automated or we're working towards getting it mostly automated and then just 
answer the questions that we need and no longer use our gut to drive you know, decisions. We're, we're using hard data. And so that's, that's helped us you know, instrumentally in, in a lot of different places. So what, talk more about the data pipeline, where the data's coming from, how you're blending it, and, right. and how you're bringing it through the pipeline and operationalizing it. Yeah, so, so we've got a lot, we have a lot of different billing systems. So we integrate companies and we let you, historically we've let them keep their billing systems. So um, just kind of bring it all together into our, our core ERP, seeing how, you know, quantities and, and just getting the data and, and just figuring out on the basic side, you know, how much do we make from a certain customer? What are we making from them, right? Um, what happens in, in different scenarios if they consolidate or, or you know, they default, right? So uh, it's a lot, and some of the pipeline there is just blending it all together, normalizing the data, making sure it's all in the same format, and then putting it in the format where our executives or, or business managers can actually make decisions off of it. Well, you're talking about the decision-making pro process, and you said it's no longer a gut. You're using data to drive your decisions, to, to, to know which direction is the right direction. How big a change is that? And it just culturally speaking, yeah. how, how has that changed? Yeah, it's huge. It's making us more, um, at least on our side, making us a lot more confident in, in the decisions we're making. We're no longer going in and saying, hey, you know, this is probably how we should do it. It's no, the numbers are showing us that this is going to pay off and, and we stick to it and look at the hard facts rather than you know, what, what do we think is going to happen. So, talk a little bit about what you guys are seeing here. You, you, and you're doing a lot of speaking here. <laughs> we, we were joking earlier, you're kind of losing your voice a yeah, little, a little bit. bit. But so, what do you, what's, what, you're telling your story, you know, what kind of reactions you're getting. Let me share with us the behind yeah, the scenes uh, at the conference. I, I think if you, at, at this conference, you've seen a lot of people kind of fall in line with similar ideas that we're trying to get to. Um, taking advantage more, instead of your traditional MPPs or your, or your traditional relational databases, moving more towards this, this Hadoop ecosystem, leveraging Spark, uh, Presto, uh, Flume, all these, these various new technologies that have emerged over the past two to, two to, two to five years, right? And are now more viable than ever. Um, they're, they're, they're easier to scale. Like if you look at your traditional MPPs, like we're a big Redshift user, but every time you scale it, there's a cost with that. And we don't necessarily need to maintain all that data all the time, so something, something with the, in the Hadoop ecosystem now lets us maintain that data without all the, all the necessary cost. Uh, so I, I, I see a lot more of that than I did two years ago. A lot more people are moving, mo following that trend. Um, I think the other interesting trend I've seen this week is this idea of becoming more cloud agnostic. I, how, where do you operate and how do you store your data is, should be irrelevant to the data processing and I think it's, it's, it's going to be a tough nut to crack for any Pentaho or any vendor, but if you, can, if you can figure out a way to either do some type of cloud parity where you have support across all your services, but you don't have to know which service you deploy to when you design your uh, pipelines, I think that would be, that, that's going to be huge. Um, I, I think we're a little ways from that, but I, I see that that's been a common theme this week as well, uh, both private and, and you know, your big three cloud providers right now, your Googles, your Azures, and your, and your AWS. So when I ask you, you so said cloud agnostic, which is great, it's a good, good vision and aspiration, but I'm, I'm, the follow-up would be, am I correct that you don't see it as data location agnostic? Right? You want to bring the cloud model to your data versus try to force your data into a cloud or not necessarily? I think this is coming from the, I, a lot of it I think is being driven by, by, by not wanting to be vendor locked in, right? So they want to have the ability to, and I think this is an e easier, easier said than done, the ability to move your data to different cloud providers based on pricing or offerings, right? And right now, you, going from AWS to Google to Azure would be a very painful process. If you move petabytes of data across, it's, it's not cost efficient, and by the time, all the savings you want to realize by moving to maybe a Google in the future are not going to be realized because of all the effort it's going to take to get there. We had CERN on earlier, and they were working on that problem, but that's <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, a pr it, it's, it's, not a it's not a trivial problem to solve. So, but you know, if you can, if you can crack that, and you can then say, hey, I want to I wanna deploy, and even, even if I'm from a service offering, like we are operating in a dark pool for Goldman, we also have a market tech side where we sell our, our trading platform in various solutions to other, other exchanges worldwide. If we, can, if we can come up with a way to be able to deploy to any cloud provider, even on a on-prem cloud, mm -hmm. without having to do a bunch of customizations each time, I mean, that'd be huge. It'd be, it would revolutionize what we do, right? So we're, we're, we're as, a, as our own company, kind of starting to look at that, and, and in talking with Pentaho, they're also, and Hitachi are starting to eye that as, as a potential way to go um, with abstractions and, and things like that, but it's, it's going to take some time. Were you guys here yesterday for the keynotes? Did you, did you see some of the keynotes? Saw some of the keynotes, yes. I mean, the, the big messaging, you know, like every conference that you go to is, be, you know, be the disruptor or you're going to get disrupted. <laughs> we talked earlier off camera, trading volumes are down. So the way you traditionally made business, or uh, uh, did business is changing and made money is changing. Right. You know, we talked earlier about you guys becoming a technology provider. I wonder if you could help us understand that a little bit from the standpoint of, you know, NASDAQ strategy, you know, when we hear your CEOs talk, Real visionary, you know, technology-driven driven transformations. Yeah, I, I think Adina's, Adina's coming in is definitely looking at, at that as, 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 a, as a trend, right? Like, 
are trading volumes are down. They've been going down. They've they've kind of stabilized a little bit, <clears throat> and, and we're we're still being able to make money in that space. But the problem is there's not a ton of growth. Mm -hmm. uh, we acquire the IC, we acquire the Chiax. We're buying market share at that point. So you increase revenue, but you also increase overhead in that way. Um, and, and you can only do so many major acquisitions at a time, right? You, you can only do how many one billion dollar acquisitions a year <laughs> before yeah. you have to call it a day. Um, and we can look at more strategic, smaller uh, acquisitions for exchanges, but that doesn't necessarily bring you the, the, the transformation, the net revenue you're looking for. So what, it, what Adina has started to look at is, is how do we transform to more of a technology company? We're really good at operating exchanges. How do we take that? We already have Market Tech doing it, but how do we make that more scalable? Not just to the financial sector, but to your other exchanges, your, your Ubers or your um, StubHubs of the world, right? How do, you, how do you become a service provider or a platform as a service for these other companies to, to come in and use your tech? So we're, we're looking at, you know, how do we rewrite our entire platform from trading to the back end mm -hmm. to do things like, can we deploy to any cloud provider? Can we deploy on-prem? Uh, can we be a little bit more technology agnostic, so to speak, and offer these as services at, and offer a bunch of microservices so that if a startup comes up one stand of an exchange, they can do it, they can leverage their services and build whatever other application they want on top of it. And I, I think that, that's, that's, that's the transformation we need to go through. Uh, I think it's a good vision, and, and I, I'm looking forward to, to executing it. It's, it's going to be a couple of years before we really before we see the fruits of that labor, but it's, it's good. Adina's really doing a, a great job of coming in and, and really driving that innovation, and, and Brad Peterson as well, our CIO, has, has really been pushing this, this uh, vision, and, and I think it's really going to work out for us, assuming we can execute. Well, you know what's interesting about that, if I may, is you know, financial services is usually so secretive about their technology, right? But your business, you guys are becoming a technology provider. So you, you know, you, you got to face the world and start marketing your capabilities now, I and mean, opening up about that, that's right. sort of an no, interesting I, change. I, th I think you'll see, you'll see that starting to become more of a thing over the, ne over the next year or two as we start actually looking to build out the platform and figure it out. You know, we've, we, do, we do market to, to, on the market tech side, I mean, it's, it's not a small business, but we, we're more strategic about how, who we market to, because we're, we're still targeting your financial exchanges right. more internationally than in the U.S., um, but there's only so many of them, so now you got to start, again, you got to start looking at rebranding, re rebuilding, and rethinking how we think about exchanges in general and not thinking of it just as a financial, a financial thing. Well, that's what I wanted to get into because you're talking about this rebranding and this rebuilding, this transformation to the backdrop uh, within an industry that is, that is changing rapidly and we have the sort of the threat of legislative reform, perhaps some administrative reforms coming down all the time. So how do you manage that? I mean, that, those are a lot of pressures there. Do you, are you constantly trying to push the envelope right up until when we're, uh, the, any changes take place, or what would you say, Sharon Michael? Yeah, probably again not the right person. To ask about <laughs> this, but um, no, we're definitely you know trying to stay on top of the cutting edge and innovation and, and the technologies out there that you know whether it be blockchain or, or, or different types of technologies. I mean, we're definitely trying to make sure we're investing in them while maintaining our core our core business. Right, it's trying to find that balance right now of, of when to when to when to make the next next step to, in the in the technology food chain and when to like balance that with regulatory obligations. And if you look at it, going back to the idea of being able to launch marketplaces, I think what you're going to end up seeing over the, over the coming years is your, your, your Ubers, your StubHubs, are going to, I think they're going to become more regulated at some level. Right. So the one, and we're good at operating more regulated markets, so I think that's where we can kind of come in and, and, and play a role and help wade through those regulations a little bit more and help build software to, to, to be adhere to those regulations. Since you brought up blockchain, right? Jamie Dimon craps all over blockchain or, <laughs> or Bitcoin. And then, you know, clarifies his remarks, saying, look, the technology underneath is here to stay. Yeah. Um, thoughts on, on blockchain? Obviously, financial services is looking yeah. at it very closely, you know, doing some really advanced stuff. What, what, what can you tell yeah, us? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it, there's, there's no argument that it's, it's definitely an innovation and a disruptive technology. I think that it's definitely in its early stages and on across the board. Um, so we're definitely, as, as we've said, we're investing in it where we can and, and trying to keep a close eye on it. We think that there's a lot of potential uh, and a lot of different applications. As the NASDAQ transforms its business. How does that affect the sort of back-end analytics activity and infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, the data is just growing. I mean, that's like the biggest challenge we have now. Data that used to be done in Excel is, is just no longer an option. So now in order to get the insights that we used to get you know, just from having a couple people doing Excel transformations, um, you need to now invest in the infrastructure in the back end. And so there's you know, a lot that needs to go into building out an infrastructure to be able to ingest the data. And then also having the UI the, on the front end so that the business can actually view it the way they want. So. So, Skills-wise, how's that affecting who you guys are hiring and training, and, and how's that transformation going? I'll let, I'll let yeah, you go yeah. first. I mean, I, I think there, there's definitely, um, you know, data analytics is a hot field, it's very new. Um, there's definitely a big skills gap in, in administrative work and, and, and the analytics side. Mm -hmm. Usually you have 
people could perform analytical functions just by being administrative or operational. Um, and now it's really, we're investing in, in analysts and, and, and making sure that we have the right people in place to be able to do these transformations or you know, pull the data and make the get the answers that we need from it. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the tech side, I think what you're seeing is where we traditionally would just plug a developer in there, whether a Java developer or an ETL developer, I think what you're seeing now is we're looking to bring more of a business-minded data analyst to the tech side, right? So we're looking to bring a data engineer, so to speak, mm -hmm. to, to more than the tech side. So we're not looking to hire a traditional you know, four-year computer science degree or uh, you know, software engineering degree. You're looking for a different breed of person uh, because quite honestly, your traditional Java dev or C++ developer, they're not, met, they're not sk skilled or geared towards data. And when we've tried to plug that paradigm in, it just doesn't really work. So what we're looking now is hiring you know, more of an analyst, but someone who's a little bit more techie as well. They still need to have those skills to do some type level of coding. And, and what we are finding is that that, that skill gap is still very much it, there's, a, there's a gap there, there's a huge gap. And I and think it's you, closing, but. And as you have to fund those <coughs> sort of new areas, um, I presume, like many companies in your business, you're trying to move away from the sort of undifferentiated, low level infrastructure deployment you know, hassles and, and the IT labor costs there, especially as you move to the cloud, presumably. So how, is that shift palpable? I mean, can you see that going on or? Yeah, I think <clears throat> we've, made, we've made a lot of progress over the past couple years in doing that. We do more you know, one button deployments where the operation cost is a lot lower. <clears throat> a lot more automation around, uh, around alerting, around, around when things go wrong. So there's not necessarily human beings sitting there watching the computer. We've invested a lot in that area to kind of reduce the cost and, the, and make the experience better for our end user, right? Um, and even from a development side, the, the cost of a new application is a lot less every time you have to do a release. The, the, the question is how do you balance that with, with the regulations and make sure you still have a good process in place, right? Like, the idea of putting single button deployments in place is a great, is a great one, but you still have to balance that with making sure that what you push to production has been tested, uh, well defined, it, it, and it meets the need, and you're not just arbitrarily throwing things out there. So, we're still try, trying to hit that balance a little bit. It's more on the back, back end side. The trading system is, is not quite there for obvious reasons. We, we're way more protective of what goes out there than, than surrounding a lot of the times, but I, I can see a future where a trading, again, going back to this idea of transforma transforming our business, where you can stand up into exchange with a click of a button. And I, I think that's, that's, that's a trend we're it's looking at. It's not too far in the future. No, I don't think yeah. it is. Last question, Pentaho report card. You know, what are they doing really well? What do you want to see them do better? Yeah, so I, I think they've been, they, they continue to focus on, in the right areas. Uh, you know, focusing more on, on the data processing side uh, around, and, and with the big data technologies, trying to play that gap, fill that gap in the big data and, and be the layer that you don't have to tie yourself to like Cloudera or MapR. You can kind of be a little bit more plug and play. Um, I, I think they still need to do some improvements on their visualizations and their front ends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I think they've been so much more focused on the data processing data, data that part of it that the, the visualizations kind of lack behind. So I think it, they need to put a little more focus into that. But all, all in all, I mean, they're they're an A, and we've we've been extremely happy with them as a mm -hmm. as a as a software provider. Great. Yeah, similar similar stuff. I think the visualization part is is the part that you know allows people to understand the value being created at Ventaho. So I think being able to you know, maybe improve a little bit on the visualization um, could go could go a far way. Yeah. Michael Shear, it's been so much fun having you in the having you on the cube and having this conversation. Um, keep that bull market coming, please. Do whatever you can. <laughs> Your best. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Knight, we are here at Pentaho World, sponsored by Hitachi Vantara. For, for Dave Vellante, we will have more from theCUBE in just a little bit. <laughs>